we're going to be discussing is the difference between two types of probability. So we discussed yesterday the concept of theoretical. You just didn't know that it was called theoretical. So theoretical probability. With theoretical probability, there is absolutely no action occurring. Theoretical probability is me showing you that we're going to flip a coin and not actually flipping it and just saying, okay, what's the probability that the coin would land on heads? Or telling you that I'm going to have a die and asking you, okay, in theory, what's the probability that it should land on a five? Okay, so theoretical probability is just looking at the specific item and then calculating it based off of, well, how many outcomes does that item have? And then how many ways can we get the event that we're asking for? So theoretical probability, it's just the number of favorable outcomes over the total number of outcomes on the actual item, okay? So one thing that I want you to write down, that there is no action. You are not performing anything. There's absolutely no action occurring. This is also known as what should happen. And that's important to know. It's what should happen. So if I flip this coin 10 times, in theory, I should land on heads how many? Five, right? Because it's half. Okay. In theory, if I roll this die, I should land on a four one out of six times, right? Because the four exists one time out of the six numbers that are on this die. So that is me not doing anything at all. I'm not actually flipping or rolling anything. I'm just identifying in theory what should happen. It's kind of like the idea of in theory, if you study a whole lot, you should do really, really well on a test. But how many of you have studied really, really hard for something and you didn't do as well as you thought you would? Has that ever happened to anybody? I know that's happened to me. And how many of you have ever not studied at all and did just well, just like perfectly fine? Okay. But again, in theory, that shouldn't happen, right? In theory, if you don't study, you shouldn't do very well. But we know that that's not always how it happens. So I know that in theory, I should land on heads half the time, but there's been plenty of times that I played a flipping the coin activity and I land on heads like seven times and tails three times. Okay. That shouldn't be happening, but in theory, it should be five and five. Okay. So let's write down our example. So for example, if we roll a die, the probability that it's going to land on a two, the probability that it's going to land on a two is one out of six. Okay, there's only a single value of two on this die out of the six values that there are. If I flip a coin, then the probability that it's going to land on tails is one out of two. These are all theoretically what should happen. Now we've got experimental probability. What's a key word that you see in experimental? Experiment, right? The term experiment. <laughs> so with experimental probability, an experiment has to happen. That means there has to be action. <coughs> so action is required. 
So I'm not going to just look at an item. I'm going to actually flip the coin and record what happens. I'm going to roll the die and record what happens because action is necessary. That means that there will be trials. There should be at least two trials. There should be at least two trials in order for you to be able to identify it as an experimental probability. And just like with theoretical, we call it the probability of what should happen. With experimental probability, we call it the probability of what actually happens because think action it actually is happening action is required you must perform some form of an experiment you must have at least two trials there has to be something physical going on and then you're recording the results of what actually happens. So it's the number of times that your event occurred. How often did your required event occur in your trials? Out of the total number of trials this time, doesn't have to do with how many possible outcomes the experiment has. It has to do with how many times you performed your experiment. So for example, I'm now going to go ahead and roll a die 27 times. And it lands on a 2 8 times. I rolled the die 27 times, it lands on a two eight times. So that means that the probability of two is gonna be eight out of 27. Maybe I went ahead and I flip a coin 70 times. And it lands on tails 30 times. So then that means here the probability of tails is 30 out of 70, which would then simplify to 3 out of 7. So you have a physical action that is going to occur. And then you are documenting those actions and using those calculated values to create your probability. Okay, so for here, we have a graph, a graph with results of an experiment in which a spinner with three equal sections is spun 60 different times. We want to know what is the theoretical probability that you're going to spin a red. So again, in this case, we're identifying the theoretical probability. Is there any action involved with theoretical probability? No. So am I going to use the experiment results? No, I am not going to use the experiment results. For a theoretical probability, I'm going to focus on the spinner. I'm going to focus on the spinner itself. Now, it said that the spinner has three equal sections. Three equal sections, and they were labeled green, red, uh, blue, and red. So what I'm going to go ahead and do because I like visuals. I'm gonna draw myself a spinner. I've got a circle and I'm gonna split it up into three equal parts. 
and I know that this is going to be my red. This is going to be my blue. This is going to be my green. So now I have a visual that I can look at. The spinner is what I use to be able to solve my theoretical probability of red. So I want the probability that it's going to land on red. How many reds does the spinner have? One. It has one red out of how many total sections? Three. So there's the theoretical probability that I'll land on a red. In theory, if I spin this three section, this three equal section spinner, I should land on red one third of the time. I should land on blue one third of the time. I should land on green one third of the time. What's one third of 60? 20, right? So that means it should be 20, 20, 20. Now look at the experiment. Is it 20, 20, 20? No, I got 21, I got 15, I got 24. So my experimental probability is going to be different than my theoretical probability. Let's take a look at what it is. The experimental probability for spinning red. So the probability this time of spinning red is going to be based off of the actual spinner's results. This is your experiment. This is your experiment that you're using. So we're going to use these results to be able to solve for the experimental probability. Your experimental probability needs an experiment. How many times did we land on red? 24 times, right? Our red is located right here. Here's the red. Okay, this one was the blue. The first one was the green. So red happened 24 times. Out of how many total spins again? 60. Now, if they didn't tell us 60, let's just say that they spun the spinner a certain number of times, but they didn't tell you how many times. How would you calculate? Maya? Just add the numbers together. They're not always going to tell you how many trials they gave you, but they will always give you the results. And if they give you all the results, you just add them together to find the total. Okay, so 24 out of 60. Can 24 out of 60 be simplified? Yes, because they are both even. So we definitely know that they're both divisible by two. They also both happen to be divisible by six. And they both happen to be divisible by 12. Okay, they both are divisible by 12. So I'm going to go ahead and divide it by 12 automatically. But if you can't do that, if you have to do it step by step, that's fine. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and divide them both by 12. And that's going to give me 2 out of 5. So 2 fifths of the time it landed on red. Now, I want to go ahead and compare. Now, let me ask you guys, do you think it's easier to compare fractions or to compare decimals or percentages? You think it's easier to compare fractions? Wow. Most people usually say it's easier for them to compare decimals. So, I'm going to go ahead and show, you're going to have to know how to convert these to decimals and percentages anyway. How do we convert a fraction to a decimal? Anybody remember from last year? You divide the numerator by the denominator. Now, I'm going to show you an even easier way with your new calculator that you should be playing around with. In your calculator, you guys have fraction buttons. Isn't that awesome? Your fraction button is located right here where it says N over D, numerator over denominator. Numerator over denominator represents your fraction button. If you hit that button, a fraction will pop up, and you can go ahead and type in a 1 over a 3. Now, these arrows right here off to the side on the top, those are going to help you navigate up and down and off and out. 
You always want to get out of your fraction once you're done typing into it. And now I wanted to go ahead and convert it into a decimal. So I could technically do one divided by three, or I could type one over three, and then there's this magic button right down here. Everybody see that double arrow white button at the very bottom, right above enter? If you press that and then hit enter, it'll change it into a decimal for you. If you want to change your decimal back into a fraction, hit that button, that double arrow button again, and it'll go ahead and convert it back into a fraction for you. That double arrow button goes back and forth between fractions and decimals. That's your best friend. That fraction button right there is going to be very useful for you guys. Okay? Now, for milestones, you still need to know how to do it by hand, which we will, of course, always practice that. But this is a tool to help you to navigate faster through your assignments. That button right there is your fraction button. There's your conversion button. So there we have our decimal version of one third. It's 0.3 repeated, 0.3 repeated. So I'm gonna go ahead and write down here that it's 0 0.333. It's always a good idea to go to the thousandth place value, thousandth place value that is going to be three digits behind the decimal. And then how do we convert that into a percentage? How do we convert that to a percentage, Alex? Move the decimal two to the right, but what causes us to move it to to the right? What is a percent out of, guys? 100. So if I multiply that by 100, that moves it to two spaces to the right, and that becomes 33.3%. 33.3%. It's very important that you understand how to do your probability in all three forms because probability is written in all three forms. Sometimes it might give you a fraction and they'd have you do the answer in a percentage. Sometimes they might give you decimals and they have you have your answers in fractions. So you need to know how to be able to convert amongst them all. Two fifths, who can raise a hand and tell me what is two fifths as a decimal? Two fifths as a decimal. Go ahead. Four tenths, thank you Paris. So 0 0.4. 0 0.4. And then what is 0 0.4 or 4 tenths as a percentage? As a percentage, what is it going to be? 40. Okay. So here is our theoretical probability, fraction, decimal, and percent. Here is our experimental probability, fraction, decimal, percent. Now we need to go ahead and make a comparison to them. We need to compare the experimental probability of red to the theoretical probability of red. So my experimental probability, I'm going to go ahead and just write it as 0 0.4 compared to my theoretical probability, which was 0 0.3 repeated. A comparison indicates that you're stating which one is bigger. So 0 0.4 is greater than 0 0.3 repeated. All right, I want you guys to go ahead and do problem number two on your own. Given the following frequency table for rolling a die, we landed on a one seven times. A two was three times. A three was three times. We landed on a four five times. Landed on the five two times. And landed on a six 12 times. Identify what the theoretical probability is for rolling a six. Identify the experimental probability of rolling a six. Please do so in all three forms. And then make a comparison of your experimental to your theoretical. Go ahead and work on that right now. Okay, let's go ahead and go over this. Theoretical probability for rolling a die and landing on a six. So again, it's the theoretical probability. That means that there is absolutely no action occurring. So that means I'm literally going to have a number cube that I'm focusing on, and I want it to land on a six. Okay, maybe this is a, the five dots here. This might be the four dots here. Okay, I want it to land with the six facing upward. So if I have a die, what's the probability of it landing on a six? 
one sixth, right? One sixth. What is one sixth in decimal format, guys? Yeah, 0 0.16 and the 6 keeps going on and on and on. So we're going to go ahead and just round that to a 7. 0 0.167, okay? And then as a percentage, 16.7%, right? All right, experimental probability, that is based off of the actual frequency. This is your experiment located right here. So that's how you use your experimental probability. So how often did we land on a six? 12 times. Out of how many times did we perform the experiment? 32. Okay, so 12 out of 32 can be simplified. They are both divisible by what value? Four. They are both divisible by a four. So I'm going to go ahead and divide 12 by four, which gives me the three. I'm going to go ahead and divide 32 by 4, which gives me the 8. And again, remember I told you that fraction button is your friend? If you forget how to simplify a fraction, look how wonderful this is. You could just type in 12 over 32 and then get out of the fraction and just hit enter. If you just hit enter, it'll simplify it for you. Your calculator here will do everything in its simplest form. Okay? So if you... Maybe you simplified it, but you weren't sure whether you simplified it all the way. Use your calculator to double check. Still use that big brain of yours, though, okay? All right, so we get 3 over 8. 3 over 8 is going to come out to 0 0.375, and that's going to be 37.5%. Okay, so now we're going to make our comparison. Again, it's probably easier to compare in decimal format. So if we're looking at 0 0.375 compared to our theoretical, which is 0 0.167, is it greater than or less than? Greater than, right? Experimental probability in this case happens to be greater. Okay, go ahead and get that copied if you need to. And then we'll go to our last page. Actually, you know what? I think what we'll do is we'll do the last page tomorrow as a warm-up. We'll do the last page tomorrow as an actual warm-up. So just go ahead and put your notes into your notebook or into your binder. And what is loaded right now into Google Classroom is your assignment for today, which is the quizzes assignment. It is 34 questions. There are quite a few questions that are relatively very simple. There are some questions that are having you focus on comparison. You get one chance, one chance only. And let me make sure that you understand. Here, I'm going to stop the video.